Okay, hello everyone. Right away, I want to thank you for coming back to my channel where we talk about learning how to make music. Uh, also, all things reading, writing, and more generally self-improvement. And in today's rendition of how music is made, we're talking about an instrument that most people aren't taught to appreciate as a musical instrument, let's say. At least that's kind of been my experience. So what are we talking about? We're talking about the human voice, but we aren't talking about singing. We're talking about talking. More specifically, we're going to try talking about the human voice as an instrument without, you know, sounding too ridiculous. We're going to try talking about ranting and just maybe talking more generally as a symphony of ideas. But I don't expect you to just strap into this video for no reason, so I'll pose the question right away. Why do I think this video can be helpful? I think this video can be helpful because whether or not you actually think talking is like a symphony of ideas, it serves as a useful metaphor for understanding the act of speaking as a skill that we can all improve upon. And I think that's what's most important. And beyond that, I think the benefit of being able to appreciate the simple act of speaking through that lens, the lens that's colored by the telling of some sort of deeper story or a, a metaphor in this case, I think the benefit is that the metaphor offers us a map. When I compare speaking or talking or ranting to a symphony, I'm talking about the act of speaking as its own kind of music, as its own uniquely harmonious act. Obviously, yes, the voice is an instrument. It's called singing. I know, I get that, I understand, but I'm not talking about singing. I'm talking about talking, you know, the act of speaking itself. I'm comparing conversation to music. I think most of us know what it's like to have, you know, an awkward conversation. And I think the mention of an awkward conversation is important here because the fact that a conversation can be awkward means that a conversation can be not awkward. And that distinction, at least in my opinion, implies what I'm going to call, you know, for lack of a better phrase, a harmony spectrum, which sounds, I know, a little silly, but you know, hopefully not too silly. Let's talk more about this harmony spectrum and I'll ask the question, how is conversing musical? How is talking or ranting like a symphony of ideas? And I think the main thing to consider is rhythm. When we speak, we speak in habituated patterns at the level of the individual word. And you know, what does that look like? It primarily looks like repeated verbal pauses. An example of which is, you know, if you say words like like or um or uh, which I know I do, um, you know, if you say these words, they probably consistently fall in the same place in your sentences. And I think that's because, you know, even if we don't realize it, our speech patterns are governed by a logic that might be best described as subconscious. And I say that because I really don't know what leads people to have certain speech habits or uh, for certain patterns to manifest when people speak. All I know is that they exist and I'm trying to nail down the exact implications of that. Okay, so I've used these filler words as an example that our speech is governed by forces that we don't understand and that we aren't always aware of. Why do I think this is important? I think it's important because the end that the example is working toward, an example that most of us are familiar with, it suggests a way that the spoken word can be understood to abide by or at least be affected by speech patterns. Now, why is that important? I think it's important because once we start talking about the act of speaking as something that's closely related to a pattern structure, once we do that, we can understand how there could potentially be a pattern structure that is harmonious, where you know the ideas being given form with language are so tightly linked that we can enter into a kind of creative flow state when we speak. And this connects back to what I was saying before about the idea of a harmony 
spectrum speech that you know varies from not harmonious to you know for for lack of a better term harmonious and i think maybe a better way of kind of nailing down what i mean is to talk about you know more harmonious speech as opposed to kind of more awkward speech there's a way in which the words we use communicate feelings to people that we're speaking to feelings that you know, don't necessarily have anything to do with the content of the speech itself. And what I mean by that is this, before I mentioned rhythm, I mentioned repeatedly using filler words, filler words like uh, or like, or um. um. So <laughs> think of someone you know who is always using the word like. Think about how they use it when they're speaking. Think about how often you know they they say it and how when you're listening to them speak your the the thoughts that are coming out the the ideas they're communicating with you are kind of interrupted by you know this recurring speech pattern and the bigger idea to be made there is that when filler words are repeatedly used they prevent the idea the speaker is aiming to convey from moving forward that's literally what's happening when we speak we want to always be using new words words we haven't used in you know the preceding sentences this rhythmic variation increases the probability that our listener remains engaged and i think that that engagement depends upon you know the the consistent progression forward of the ideas and again that connects back to the specific um, the particular words that are being used and employed obviously maintaining the interest of the listener depends on a number of factors. I'm just talking about, you know, conversational flow right now because again, I'm trying to give you some idea of how talking or ranting or speaking, whatever you want to say, is like a symphony of ideas or could be understood as something that something closely approximating musical composition. And I think in order to do that, we have to break the expression of an idea down into its simplest parts, being the words themselves. I suppose my point in saying all of this is to you know, encourage you to pay attention to the words you hear yourself saying when you speak. If you're repeatedly using filler words, you're getting in the way of yourself, even if you're doing it unconsciously. And to kind of drive that example home, I ask you to imagine this. Imagine if in a piece of music there were randomly distributed, you know, second long silences that are distributed throughout at kind of random increments throughout the song. Odds are if you're listening to the piece of music, it's going to feel disjointed and disconnected and disorganized. The repeated silence in the in the music are going to prevent you from being pulled into and affected by the music itself. And I'm using this analogy to give you some idea of what happens when we use filler words and why you know, we have to eradicate them to the best of our ability from our vocabulary. And it has to do with the idea of speech, of talking, as a kind of musical act. If we eliminate filler words from our vocabulary, the act of talking and the act of speaking becomes something much more harmonious, something that's much more similar to, you know, a symphony of ideas. And that's because the language we use to move from idea to idea isn't always being snagged and held back by repeated words and words that you know, kind of draw the listener's attention back to some some previous moment in a way that kind of isn't focused on the uh, development of the ideas themselves, if that makes sense. My all-time favorite writer, James Joyce, was famous for saying that the meaning of a word or a series of words is inseparable from the sound of the words themselves. And this is an idea that I hope will stick with you after the video ends. And that's because when we speak, we are making music. The greatest orators in human history, people like you know Winston Churchill and Martin Luther King Jr. and JFK, just to name a few, the greatest orators understand that talking is a form of music and a form of you know sonically patterned meaning. And I'll pause here to reiterate what I just said. Speaking coherently implies the effective employment of sonic patterns. That's what speaking is. We're, we're making music when we speak. And it's so important that we understand it as such because it offers a lens through which we can 
understand our own improvement as far as our ability to communicate with other people is concerned. Because once we understand how these sonic patterns function at the level of the word, we can move to higher levels of abstraction, let's say, meaning we can start to talk about the musicality of collectives of words, meaning sentences, and, and beyond that, of collectives of sentences, meaning paragraphs. And once we do this, we begin to see how the movement between these higher units of abstraction mimic the movements of what we see at the level of the word, which is to say kind of these smaller units of abstraction. And because all of these collectives are composed, you know, most fundamentally of words as the smallest unit, the analogy I think is warranted. The same way that there is a, a harmonious way to move forward when we speak, there's a harmonious and musical logic that can govern how ideas unfold themselves. And I think in this way, ranting or talking or you know, speaking, whatever the word you wanna use is, um, it can be like a symphony of ideas. It can be something that's musical. Okay, and with that, I just want to say thank you for sticking with me through this video. If you enjoyed this video or found it useful or helpful or interesting, I ask that you please hit the like button, please hit the subscribe button, um, and let me know what you thought in the comment section down below. Thank you again, everyone. I hope you have a great rest of your day, and I will see you next time.